Welcome to episode 45 of Shane Talks 99. It is October 15th, 1999, and I am Jack's memory. I am Jack's nostalgia. I am Jack's happiness. And like the most David Lynch film of this entire weekend is obviously Fight Club. The bizarre, creepy, and dark tones that like they just scream that it's a David Lynch film. But that's not the David Lynch film that we're going to be talking about this weekend. Um, of all of the David Lynch films, the David Lynch film is ever, that David Lynch has ever made, the film we're going to talk about this week for David Lynch is the most not David Lynch film that there could possibly be. And somehow, somehow it's still a truly amazing film that I absolutely love. It, it's nothing like what I expected or would ever want from David Lynch. But the fact that I got it from David Lynch and the fact that this movie is so good uh, just makes it a really enjoyable film. So, like, the funny thing is, if I came to hear about David Lynch uh, and me in 1999, I was in the process of becoming a huge David Lynch fan. Like, I had experienced David Lynch before this. Like, um, in high school, I had rented Fire Walk with me, which I, I literally only, like, rented it because of the box art on it. Like, I thought the box art was really cool. So, like, that was my first introduction to David Lynch in high school. And, like, I didn't really even know who or what David Lynch was. And so, like, I didn't honestly really like that movie the first time that I saw it. Like, I was very confused. And, like, I understand, like, that's kind of the purpose of David Lynch. But, like, I was confused to the point that, like, I couldn't even enjoy the movie. And so, like, I didn't really realize that that's what david lynch was all about and so like fire walk of me tried to pick up this story about laura palmer at the beginning at the end at the beginning and like i had seen lost highway as well like around the same time so like i i kind of had an idea of what i was getting into but like i didn't i hadn't watched the twin peaks show so i didn't understand i didn't understand that fire walk with me was so important important after you'd seen all of like what Twin Peaks really was so in 1999 uh my time spent at the art house theaters like my David Lynch knowledge just wasn't up to par with where it would be by the next year when when we would get Mulholland Drive but in my early days at Castles and Arts in 1999, having talked about Twin Peaks with some of the people that worked there, I was instructed how to fix the error of my ways. And so, like, I ordered the European bootleg of the pilot um, off the Internet. It was one of the first things I ordered off the Internet. Got this DVD that had the pilot for the Twin Peaks movie, um, which I would later then learn was not the right thing to watch either because uh, the European version of Twin Peaks was designed just to be a movie and not a pilot, so they put an ending onto it that wasn't in the American version. So then finally, I was lent like the box set of Twin Peaks, the first one that came out because I own some of the later ones. But like I got the Twin Peaks box set that I, that I borrowed from somebody at Castleton Arts and started watching them correctly in order and just absolutely fell in love with what Twin Peaks was and how that storytelling goes and everything. And then once I got all the way through both seasons of Twin Peaks, rewatched Fire Walk with me, you know, five years after I watched it in high school, I absolutely love and appreciated what David Lynch was and became a huge David Lynch fan in 2000. Mulholland Drive is going to come out. And I literally wrote a 10 page dissertation on Mulholland Drive and what I thought was happening in Mulholland Drive. Got a lot of input from some of my Castleton Arts people, but like, that's how obsessed I became with David Lynch and especially with Mulholland Drive was like, I, I had to I had to understand and process and figure everything out. I had to figure out what was going on in this movie and what meant what and what all the subtext was. And like, that's one of the things that I love about all of David Lynch films. Except this one. In October of 1999, I watched the film Straight Story. And I honestly don't even know if I knew it was a David Lynch film at the time that I watched it. If I did know it was a David Lynch film, like it didn't sink in with me that like this is the same guy that makes his really bizarre stuff that I actually really like. So like I sat down, I watched the straight story and I cannot lie. I absolutely love this movie. I think it is so good. And like I remember the day that I was sitting on the couch at Castleton Arts and like it was one of those glass breaking moments where somebody made the comment about, oh, yeah, David Lynch did straight story. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute, like David Lynch from Twin Peaks. David Lynch made straight story like this completely. I'm a little, I'm a, a straight story. Like a lot of David Lynch's stuff is, you know, 
storytelling all over the place, you know, multiple storylines going on, multiple plots going on, time shifting in some of them, like, you know, stuff in like Lost Highway where it's, it's circular time stuff, or like in Holland Drive where time kind of doesn't matter, especially like just David Lynch is a master at storytelling, non-linear and, and just not typical straight storytelling. So the fact that he was responsible for this movie that's just literally an A to B plot, nothing crazy, nothing bizarre, nothing out of the ordinary, like straight story. The, the, I can still remember sitting there talking to Scott Grow and having that moment where I realized, wow, this guy is more than just a bizarre filmmaker. Like he can tell a really, really good story. Like David Lynch, like he just he's he's the guy that's responsible for things like Blue Velvet. Uh, he's responsible for Wild at Heart, Eraserhead, Elephant Man, like the Dune that I grew up with. Are they're they're all brilliant stories in their own? Like because they all just bring something unique and special to like filmmaking and storytelling in general. But when we get to 1999. And we get to the straight story. It is legitimately a straightforward narrative. Like, to be honest, and, and like, just like I explained, like, I love David Lynch for how bizarre a lot of his stuff is. But this film uh, was written by a woman named Mary Sneed. Uh, she was a longtime collaborator with David Lynch. She wrote a lot of the movies that he did. I'm sorry, she was an editor on a lot of the movies that, she, that he did. And then this was the first thing that she wrote. Uh, when David Lynch read it, he immediately said, I have to make this movie. Um, it's based on a true story, which if you know anything about me, you know I'm not a huge biopic person. So this is like one of those weird, rare exceptions. Like, I don't know how much of it is true. I've never looked into this guy's real story to see, you know, what was changed or what was fictionalized. I think the fact that I didn't do that is why I can kind of enjoy this. But like, this film is so good at just being a film about people about people from the Midwest specifically, uh, about a guy from Iowa who decides to ride a riding lawnmower to visit his brother in Wisconsin, uh, who he hasn't talked to in over 10 years because they got in a fight. And, and our main character is such a stubborn guy that he has never reached out to apologize to his brother. And for whatever reason, at this point, 10 years later, his brother has a stroke and he decides that he wants to go make amends with his brother. And like, he, he doesn't have a driver's license, he doesn't own a car, he can't drive there, so he literally buys a John Deere riding lawnmower tractor trailer thing and just, you know, sets out to go the 200 and some odd, 60, 80, 200 and some odd miles that it takes to, to get from Iowa to Wisconsin going five miles an hour. And then the movie is just literally about all the people that he meets along the way, Um the the you know young girl who gets knocked up who's you know contemplating having an abortion um the the woman who hits a, a deer and is like just breaking down on the side of the road because you know she's in that road and then that night he pulls up on their camp and ends up hanging out with them at night like the movie is just all about people it's about relating and connecting to people. It's about telling stories with people. It's about, you know, sharing life experiences with people. And it is so worth every minute of this movie. Like Richard Farnsworth plays our lead character in this movie. His daughter is played by Sissy Spacek. Uh, she's the one that tells him about his brother having the stroke and, you know, kind of just convinces him to go on, on, on this journey um harry dean stanton plays his brother uh very small part but harry dean stanton does a lot of work with david lynch so really cool to see him in a small part uh chris farley's real life brothers uh kevin and john farley are both in this movie so like i can't even begin to express to you how enjoyable this film is just from a people watching standpoint from a feel-good standpoint from a like this is what it's like you know, to narratively connect with people because, like, our, our main character is is kind of an asshole at the beginning of the film. Like, you don't start off liking him. Like, he is a very rough, a very angry, a very bitter. Like, you understand why him and his brother got in a fight ten years ago and why he has never, you know, stood up to take, you know, to become a man to say like I need to, you know, make amends with my brother until now. You know, it takes his brother's stroke. For him to finally have that moment and from that time on as he goes on his journey and he meets people and he talks to people and he talks to them about their lives and talks about his life everything in this movie is just so 
enjoyable. And it's so not a David Lynch film. And I think that that's part of what I really like about it. Like, again, I, I would like the movie no matter who directed it, I think. But I think just the fact that, like, I know that somebody who does as bizarre stuff as David Lynch is capable of of just getting these performances and telling such a deep and powerful and meaningful story about just the human the human connection with other people. I you are not gonna you're not gonna hate your time you spend in this. I think it's like a two hour movie. There's a lot of shit out there that you could watch instead. I highly recommend the straight story. It's amazing. The next film that we're going to talk about is also pretty amazing. It's a really good and enjoyable film. It's just unfortunately one I'm not really at a point in life where I can talk, like I can really discuss this movie like I think it deserves to be talked about. Um, the, the second movie that came out this weekend was a movie called The Story of Us. Hey, straight story, story of us. We had two stories that came out the same weekend. Okay, that was that was cheesy. That was yeah, whatever. This story is a different story. This story is about a marriage that is falling apart. Uh, and it is about the two people looking back over their lives and, you know, kind of trying to determine if, you know, they have something worth saving or not. So I absolutely love this movie. I really do. Um, I'm going to do my best to talk about it. I will probably go pretty quick. Um, the film stars Bruce Willis, who at this moment in time was still starring in The Sixth Sense, which was still doing really well at the box office. Um, so he had two movies in the theater in 1999 at the same time. Uh, this one definitely got overshadowed quite a bit. Uh, his co-star in the movie plays his wife as Michelle Pfeiffer. Obviously, she's amazing at all the rom-coms that she does. Um, it is directed by Rob Reiner. Uh, Rob Reiner is just a master of like all the genres. Like I can't even say that like he's a good comedian director or a good action or like not even action drama director. Like I mean, this is the guy that did The Princess Bride, When Harry Met Sally, The American President all great, you know, rom-com type movies. He did Stand By Me, Misery, and A Few Good Men, all really good dramas. And then, like, of course, this is the dude who started his career by directing This Is Spinal Tap, easily one of the greatest comedies, like, ever, ever made. Like, Rob Reiner is a master at telling stories. He's a master at taking scripts and and getting absolutely top-notch A-level performances out of his actors, the story of us is is nothing different. Bruce and Michelle like do a phenomenal job as a couple who drop their kids off at summer camp. And then after that, we are introduced to the fact that they've been married for 15 years and they are both very unhappy. Uh, during the summer, they decide to take a trial separation and live apart. And during that time apart, we, we get to see them with their friends, uh, talking to their groups of friends, talking about their relationship, and then, of course, we get nonlinear stuff, which absolutely anybody who knows me knows that I love nonlinear storytelling. So I enjoy the fact that that is a part of this movie. We get a lot of flashbacks to the happier times, the not so happy times, and how they get through those happy times, how they get through those not happy times. Just we get a lot of flashbacks of like what happened in their relationship that made this couple what they are. And um, it's it's amazing. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad. Um there's a lot of funny and there's a lot of angry. It's an amazing character study in relationships. And it unfortunately, uh, rewatching it was really, really tough for me to get through. Um, watching two characters fall in love, watching two characters um, flirt and, and get to know each other. And then, you know, as you're watching that, you know where it ends up. And so it's the tragedy of knowing that despite how happy they think they are in certain moments, you know where the story is going to take them. And it's very, very unfortunate, very, very tough for me to watch. Um, it's it, in the third act, they end up going and picking up their kids after they've made the decision to tell them, you know, what their decision is and that kind of stuff. And so I'd say the last three to five minutes of this movie are really rough watching how things play out between them and their kids. And so like, it's it's a great flick. It really is. Like I I like the movie a lot. I always liked the movie. Divorce is just a really difficult topic for me right now. So it was really not the best time in my life to have been watching this. Um, I look forward, you know, down the road to revisiting it, maybe for its 30th anniversary, uh, giving it another go, and hopefully being at a better point in life where I can you know enjoy the movie again. 
Um, but like the the script is amazing. It is a really good script. The cast is awesome. Rob Reiner even has a small part, you know, as one of Bruce Willis's friends in the movie. Uh, Rhea Wilson is in the movie. Tim Matheson's in the movie. Betty White is in this movie. Like a lot of great comedy goes into this movie and it's it's really worth your time i promise it is i don't understand why rotten tomatoes gives it a 26 percent. i feel like the film is far better than that on imdb it's got a 6.0 still think it's a little bit better than that but that's more in line of like i can accept the fact is you know the majority of people give it a 6.0 not a 26 percent. so can't really agree with the critics on that one um all right well i, I think i've said enough about the story bus i highly recommend it um yeah. The meat of this episode. The most David Lynch like movie that came out this weekend that was not directed by David Lynch. Instead, um, it was directed by David Fincher, a different date. And it's based on a book by a guy named Chuck Palinuk. Palinuk, I think I'm saying his name right. Um, but yeah, so David Fincher, different David, uh directed this movie. Um, and he had just come off of two other movies that I absolutely love. He directed seven. And he directed the Michael Douglas film, The Game. Both of them, I think, are absolutely amazing movies. Um, his first film he ever did was Alien 3, the third movie in the Alien franchise, which I need to watch the director's cut because I've heard the director's cut is far superior to the regular version. Not a big fan of the regular version. Again, I have been told multiple times, give the director's cut a chance. I will do that at some point. Um, so, yeah, these three movies from 95, 97, 99, like... David Fincher had a great run of a lot of movies that I really dug. Uh, great storytelling, great, you know, scripts that he was working on or was, you know, not written by him, but other people wrote these scripts and he did a great job of adapting them to the screen. Um, overall, I'd say I really enjoyed David Fincher's career. I think he makes more movies that I like than I don't like. Um, and so, like, granted, he's had a few in there that I didn't really care for. But overall, I'd say the majority of his stuff is, is stuff that I really enjoy. So let's talk about Fight Club. Well, the first rule of Fight Club is we don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule of Fight Club is we don't talk about Fight Club. Well, I'm going to break both of those rules because I have a lot to say about Fight Club. Fight Club, when I talk about how amazing 1999 was for film and we've got stuff like The Matrix and The Sixth Sense and Star Wars... Fight Club is right up there. Like Fight Club is one of those movies that defined this year and the subtext and so much of what was going on in Fight Club really just leads to how great 1999 was for film. Fight Club, Fight Club is the story of the narrator. Fight Club is the story of the narrator and Tyler Dirk. And the story of these two men is like seriously close to perfect. The third act reveal uh, of their relationship is like next level manipulative storytelling. The script itself, based on the book, was written by a guy named Jim Ools, um, whose only other major studio film that he wrote is a movie in 2008 called Jumper. Um, I'm baffled as to why these are the only two like big things he's ever written. I don't know why his like, you know, Hollywood credit didn't just skyrocket after Fight Club because Fight Club was amazing. Uh, Fight Club was phenomenal. Uh, it's literally one of the best scripts of 1999. And like Fight Club is, the reason why I say that is because like Fight Club is the Gen X movie. Like Fight Club is what Generation X was all about. Like Fight Club, Fight Club deals with the narrator um, who has this dull and boring life. And in a very like a Gen X, like angsty, angry, hate-filled moment, he decides that he he just has this mental break and psychologically physiological not physiological like um I don't know he has a mental breakdown to the point where he creates a split personality of Tyler Durden, which I guess is kind of a spoiler. And I know, like, a lot of times on the show, like I say, oh, I'm not going to spoil it. I really want you to go watch this movie. Like, when it's one of those, like, smaller independent art house things that, like, I don't think a lot of people have seen. But I'm sorry, man. This is Fight Club. And if I just spoiled Fight Club for you, like, I'm sorry. Uh, but Fight Club came out 25 years ago. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. And you should have taken the time to to watch it by now. So I am sorry if I spoiled the fact that the narrator and Tyler Durden are the same person. But, like, it's kind of important to what I have to talk about. 
So I kind of need to address that. So like the narrator creates Tyler Durden because he, his mind needs to create a split personality to deal with all the things that he's not comfortable dealing with. He has a very dull and boring job and just is so unhappy with his life, but does not know how to change it. He doesn't have anything to look forward to. He doesn't have anything driving him or motivating him. He just, he's caught in an extremely boring life. And the only way that his mind and his brain can escape that is to create this alternate personality who convinces his normal self to do things that he normally wouldn't do because his alternate reality, his alternate person that he pretends is his friend does all of these things for him and and, and pushes him and, and makes him do things that he wouldn't normally do. The most obvious of, of all of these things that he does is, is when we get to Marla. Marla is somebody who... Uh, the narrator meets before he creates his alternate personality. But once he creates Tyler Durden and Tyler steps up and does all the things sexually with Marla that our narrator would never normally do because he was too shy, like the, Tyler Durden does those things to to make the narrator jealous of him and to start pushing him to also just kind of see Marla in a different way. Um, his His ego just his ego as the narrator begins to try to keep up with what his alter ego of Tyler is doing. And so it's this constant back and forth between the two of them where Tyler keeps pushing things to another level and the narrator has to do things to try to, you know, keep up with that. But while doing that, it's making himself more like the Tyler character that he was you know, previously. So it's just an amazing dynamic and it is so well written. And this film is just filled with so much humor. Like there's there's so much funny stuff that goes on in a very violent film. Like it it's funny and there's serious stuff that goes on and it, it just it it balances them out really well. There's there's humor and there's angst and, and there's angst with cynicism and angst with sarcasm. And like, it's all there and it all just blends and works so well together because you're really laughing at all of this stuff that, you know, is, is angry and hateful. Um, it just, it gives you this outlet as you're watching it to have these, you know, vast feelings and emotions all, you know, intertwined together. Like, you know, us, us that grew up as young men in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, like the Gen X men were angry. But we also really wanted to be funny at the same time that we were angry. So, like, watching the narrator throughout the course of this film accept who he is and accept who Marla is and accept what Project Mayhem is and what Project Mayhem represents. And then just standing by and watching as everything around him crumbles to the ground, everything that he built up, everything that he was responsible for, he gets to the point where he's willing to just let it all rumble and crash and burn to the ground like it's just so as a psychological film so interesting and entertaining to watch how this broken mind works and it and then gets to the point where it attempts to repair itself um it's 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 an amazing film it's got a top-notch cast on it i've already I mentioned Ed Norton. Uh, Ed Norton was literally just coming off of American History X, which is still one of the best films I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, Brad Pitt is Tyler Durden, is literally one of the most beautiful and sexiest men on the planet. Um, Helena Bonham Carter uh, plays Marla, and she does it absolutely amazing. Um, she's weird and creepy, and probably, you know, th there's a lot of female characters in 99 that kind of, you know, attracted me to this, you know, purple hair bizarre weird you know kind of you know goth girl and like marla's definitely like at, at the top of that list of girls that helped me realize that i found that attractive um and like i assume part of you know my history of being attracted to very mentally unstable women probably you know is a direct relation to finding marla attractive in this movie um so yeah, Marla definitely probably has a huge influence on the type of women that I that I pursued in my life. Uh, Meatloaf is in this movie. Meatloaf, uh, he plays Bob. Uh, Bob had bitch tits. Um, Bob is one of the best characters in this entire movie. Uh, Jared Leto is also a member of Project Mayhem, and he is just, just, he's just so damn blonde. And uh, we also have Holt McCallany. McCallany, I always don't know how to say his name right. 
Um, Holt, we just talked about a couple of weeks ago because he had a small bit part in Mumford. Um, it is a is a good year in '99 for Holt. Um, Fight Club spoke to me. Fight Club spoke to a huge generation of Gen X angry men who needed something to help us deal with our anger and with our aggression and give us something to focus it on and show us that you know it's okay. Um, there there is ways to deal with our anger. Um, and yeah, so Fight Club really, really spoke to me. The film really, really caught all of that emotion and and dealt with it really well, like better than well. Like, it dealt with it perfectly. Fight Club is one of the definitive films of 1999. It is a brilliant example of what I think is near perfect storytelling. Um, I really just, I, I can't express how perfect it hit men of my generation and my age group. And I mean, I'm sure it did for men older than me as well. Next week, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, next week, there's seven films that I'm technically supposed to talk about. Not really bad, but I don't know how I'm going to squeeze like seven movies into one episode and not have it be like an hour long. I don't want it to be an hour long. I have literally no interest in talking about, you know, these films for an hour. So hopefully I'm going to be able to find a way to keep the next until next weekend i do have one last thing to say on this episode and i will leave you with this little tidbit in life a member of project mayhem does not have a name but in death a member of project mayhem does have a name and his name is robert paulson <laughs>